the book, Chapter 5, Wild Flights, yeah. as read by Lorianne Cole, the yes. author, co-author. Chapter 5, Wild Flights. Dawn broke slowly in Alpendorf, as though it wasn't quite in the mood. Wren opened the shutters wide and stared out at the dried remains of last year's herb garden. The frost was already melting off the pathway, even though the sun hadn't yet appeared over the eastern rim of the mountains. It was going to be a great day for traveling. Too bad she was stuck here in this stupid, boring village with her stupid, boring brother. Wren looked over at Al. He was seated at Auntie Willie's preparation table, his blonde head bent over a book. Apparently, he didn't even notice that the dried apple she had given him for breakfast had a worm in it. He'd eaten the whole thing absent-mindedly as he poured over that old history of Kriegsland that he'd read a hundred times. Owl was no fun at all. Hawk would have thrown the apple at her if she had tried something like that on her. On him. On him, well. The insistent sound of geese honking to one another in formation drew Wren's attention back outside. She watched them fly northward, northward out of sight and beyond the ridge of the mountains. If I had wings, she thought to herself, I'd fly far away from here. I could even fly to Sigberg. Wouldn't that surprise Falcon and Hawk? If only she knew how to get there. Wren looked over at Haw Owl, who was oblivious to the world outside his book. He probably knew the way. He knew just about everything. If she could find out from him how to get there, maybe she wouldn't need wings after all. She could just run away like Hawk, and she'd never ever have to scrub pots and mend linens for the headsman's wife. Al would never tell her the way to Sigburg if she told him why she needed to know. After all her life, he told her that she needed to grow up and act like a normal girl. Tricking Al wasn't easy, though. She'd have to be careful. Hey, Al! Hmm? You figure Falcon has found Hawk by now? Al turned to Paige glancing at her briefly. His eyes, the color of the night sky, always seemed to look right through her. A lot of people would have thought this was creepy. Wren knew it was just because he couldn't see very well at a distance. Well, Al said, it's about a 16-hour walk, so theoretically Falcon could be in Sigborg by now. That doesn't mean they've run into each other, though. Sigborg is much larger than Alpendorf. They'll find each other, said Wren. Remember when we used to play hide-and-seek? Falcon always knew where to find Hawk, no matter what. Owl made a non-committal sound, returning to his book. What do you think Sigborg is like? Owl flipped back several pages in his book without looking up. It says here that there used to be a center for trade due to the proximity to the dwarven tin mines. The mines are exhausted now. They were there long before Sigborg was a part of Volman. What's Volman? Al gave her a sharp glance. Volman is where we live, he said severely. Didn't you ever listen when people talk about the world outside Al Alpendorf? This village is located in the Duchy of Volman. So is the barony of Sigborg, and Volman is the southern part of Kriegsland. Do you even know what Kriegsland is? Wren pretended to be interested. Sure, it's a kingdom or whatever. Is there a map of Volman in there? She asked, moving to his side and peering at the book. Of course. I'll show her, but it was just a bunch of wavy black lines and dots that didn't make a whole lot of sense to Wren. Alvendorf wasn't even on the map. So Sigborg is a trade center, she said at last. Well, not so much anymore, said Al. The tin mines ran out many years ago. There is still rumored to be a powerful nexus of magic located in the center of the valley, but only magic folks would know about that. These days, the rumors say Sigborg is something of a ghost town. 
With real ghosts? Wren asked excitedly. Al quirked an eyebrow at her. It's just an expression. Now don't bother me. I'm trying to read. With that, he bent his book, had bent his head back over his book. Wren mentally scanned over what Al had said about Sigborg, looking for a topic that might interest him. Trade? Boring. Tin mines? Nexus of magic? Hmm. What's a nexus of magic? Al looked up. Do you know how magic works? He asked. No, she said, hiding a smile when she saw his attentive expression. It's a kind of energy, he said. And if that energy of a magic item fades over time, it can be recharged at a nexus point. I imagine those who practice magic can harness that energy somehow themselves as well. How come you know so much about magic, she said. Everyone else in the village is scared of it. I think magic is interesting, Al said. Wilhelmina had quite a lot of knowledge on the subject. He didn't look excited, but she noticed that he had absent, absently closed his history book. When it came to the subject of magic, apparently, she had his undivided attention. And then in a flash, she knew the key to getting just what she wanted. Wren wore a real key around her neck, a big gold one. She'd had it since she was a baby. It was useless, and she had no idea where it came from, but it always reminded her of something very important. There's a way into anything, if only you could find the key. I bet that you could learn to do magic, she said casually to her brother cast spells and stuff? Al just stared her in his strange, unfocused way. I've thought of that, he said honestly, but only a few people have the gift. Statistically speaking, it's somewhat unlikely that I'm one of those people. I wonder how you could find out for sure, said Wren thoughtfully. I suppose any user of magic could tell me. Why haven't you asked before? There aren't any users of magic at Alpendorf, silly. Wren tried to look as innocent as possible. I'll bet that there are magic users in Siegburg, he said. She said, what with the Nexus and all. That had occurred to me, said Al blandly. Okay, so she wasn't being that clever. But if he'd thought about it before, it must be important to him. So how come you never went to Sigburg, he, she asked. It didn't seem worth abandoning my family and walking for two days just to hear an answer that was more likely negative. But you wouldn't be abandoning your family if you went now. Right now you have more family over there than you do here. Wren could see Al thinking it over, intrigued by the possibility. She nearly had him, she could tell. Then he shook his head. I can't leave you here by yourself, he said. I'll go with you, Wren said with delight. Al's face, Shuttle. which had just begun to open gradually during the conversation about magic, suddenly slammed shut again. No, he said abruptly and opened his book. Oops, bad move. She'd have to undo the damage somehow. Okay, so someday I'd like to see Siegburg, she said carefully. But it, it doesn't seem fair that you should be stuck here when you really want to do is find out if you have magic. Wouldn't it be neat if you could? The town elders would never make a magic user herd sheep. Al made no comment, but she could see he wasn't reading, just staring at the page. So don't worry about me, she pressed on. I won't get into any trouble. You could just go. I don't trust you here by yourself, Al said. He was staring very fixedly in front of him as though running calculations in his mind. I wouldn't. I'm not leaving you here by yourself, and you're not going to Sigvarg, and that's final. Oh, no. When Al said something was final, he really meant final. He wasn't like Hawk, who would give in if she looked really sad or made him laugh. Wren heaved a huge sigh and turned away. 
Glumly, she looked around at the dusty ramshackle hut. Now that Auntie Willie was gone, there weren't any, even any healing chores to do. Everyone had thought that she would live forever. Then one day, when she had been hard at work as usual, frowning over a bunch of strong medicinal tea, she just lay her head down on the table and died. No fuss, no nonsense. That was just like her. Sometimes Wren would bring little gifts to the place where they buried her and try her hardest to be sad. But really, all Auntie Willie had ever done was yank burrs out of her hair and give Owl awful tasty medicine and scold them all. Wren was grateful to Auntie Willie for raising them, but she really couldn't miss her. You'll have to stay with the headman and his wife, Owl said out of nowhere. Wren turned back to look at him, puzzled for a moment. When she realized what he was talking about, she had to hide the huge grin that was starting to explode across her face. She would have to put up a token protest, or he'd be suspicious. Forget it, she said. She'll, she'll just put me to work, you know she will. It will only be for a few days, said Al. I don't trust you by yourself. If I'm going to go, I should go this morning while the weather is good and before Hawk and Falcon return. Okay, said Wren with a show of reluctance. But you have to promise me something. Like what? A dagger! Al's eyebrow twitched slightly. This was his version of a shocked expression. What would you want with such a thing? If you don't promise, I won't stay with the headsman and his bossy wife. All right, I promise. But you have to promise me in return that you will not cause the headsman's wife even the slightest bit of trouble while I'm gone. I promise not to cause any trouble, Wren said, crossing her heart. That much she could guarantee. The headsman's wife wouldn't be at all concerned since Wren had every intention of following Al to Sigborg. <laughs> the old dwarf snoozed on. Falcon had been standing by the fire at the Adventures Guild Hall for merely ten minutes, hoping that the Guildmaster would wake on his own, but it didn't look likely. Excuse me, sir, he said. May I speak to you? The guild master stirred slightly, then started to snore again. Sir? The guild master blinked, looking startled. But, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. His eyes seemed to focus gradually, and he gave a little start of recognition. You're still alive. Hello, I'm sorry to bother you. I'm Falcon. The guild master scratched his beard. Falcon, eh? I could have sworn you said hawk. Just goes to show my memory is like these days. Hawk is my brother, Falcon explained. The guild master just shot him a look, of, a dubious look. I, I was wondering if you could help me, Falcon continued. I need to know something about the local area. I, I heard there have been fires in the town. Oh, yeah, I see how you are, Wolfgang said peevishly. Yesterday you have no time to listen to an old man, but once you run afoul of a few laughers and you find yourself banged up, suddenly you're all ears. Actually, that was my brother. I've never been in here before. He told me about you, and I thought you'd be a good person to ask for advice. Oh, your brother, I see. It was your brother who was the one fighting laughers with his fancy sword, and now you're concerned how your brother might have stumbled into more danger than he can handle. Falcon blinked. Um, right? Wolfgang just stared at Falcon, then sighed. The fires, yeah, this is a very dangerous place. He rubbed his beard, looking distressed. Always has been a bit on the exciting side, what with all the magic folks that tend to hang around here. But it used to be a happy place. That was before all the death and the disappearing and the monsters and, and now the brigands harassing everyone. Old Stefan, excuse me, his lordship the Baron, wouldn't so much as poke his head out of the keep. He may be dead for all we know. The whole land's gone to ruin. I tell you, ruin. Not like the old days. Why... I recall a time when Schultz and I... Have you met Schultz? He's the sheriff now. Well, he and I were out in the woods 
caught by an ogre one day. And, and you know, even two strapping men like he and, and I weren't able to take on an ogre. Well, as I recall, this is a particularly nasty one. Wolfgang began to rattle on for a while while running this way and hiding that way, and Falcon tried to listen politely. As the story got more and more convoluted, Falcon realized that nothing short of a natural disaster would stop Wolfgang if he didn't interrupt. I'm sorry, he broke in, but you said something about fires. The sheriff also mentioned them. Are they anything I should be worried about? The guildmaster made a wheezy sound of dismay. Fires, yeah, the fires. Some kobold's gone nuts, and instead of cleaning houses, he's burning them down. Most of the kobolds cleared out of here years ago when the place got cursed. This place is cursed? Wolfgang gave a tremendous start. For heaven's sakes, keep your voice down, son. Wolfgang paused for a dramatic effect, beckoned Falcon closer, and whispered in his ear, it's the curse that's to blame for everything. Brigands, monsters, crop failure, avalanche, even the four lost children, all of it. What children? Eh? said Wolfgang, blankly. You said there were lost children? I don't recall that I said anything about children, said Wolfgang, but that does remind me of a story. Falcon considered interrupting again. <coughs> about how the Baron's son rode off one day and never came back. The Baron has a son? Had a son. That Baronet Barnard. Handsome young man, not much older than you. There's a reward out for him, but he's been gone a couple of years now. Everyone but the Baron has given up. Maybe he ran away? Not likely, said Wolfgang. See, the horse came back. Barnard didn't. Falcon felt a by now familiar chill. What do you think happened to him? Wolfgang shrugged. Some say it was the brigands killed him, but there were a lot less brigands back then. And as I recall, someone said his horse was all torn up. Probably a monster of some kind ate him. Falcon shuddered. Thank you, he said to the guildmaster. I should go. I have to clean the stables. But I'll tell Hawk what you just said. Wolfgang raised his bristly eyebrows. Oh, yeah, he said. And while you are at it, why don't you tell Hawk that it's much easier to keep things straight if you just tell the truth and keep your right name at all times? Bewildered and troubled, Falcon left the guild hall. He turned things over in his mind as he headed to the castle, stopping only briefly to stare at the stream that passed under the northern road bridge. It flowed merrily uphill before curving back around the eastern road. It had to be the same stream that he bathed in the day before, which would mean the town was surrounded by its magic. That somehow was a reassuring thought. He watched the stream sparkle and splash on its way for a moment, and then he forced himself to continue up the sloping road. He wasn't looking forward to mucking out the stables, but if it would help Hawk pay Shamin and Shima fairly, it was the least he could do. If all went well, this would be their last night at the Hero's Tale Inn. The sun was starting to sink toward the distant mountain peaks, turning the air of the valley soft and golden. Hawk swung a long stick this way and that with both hands while he waited impatiently for Falcon to show up for weapons practice outside the western town gate. After yesterday's successful hunt, all of the laufers had appeared to have made themselves scarce. Hawk and Falcon would need some money for mucking the stables tonight. After a few moments of shadow fencing, Hawk saw his brother trudging slowly towards him from town. Either Falcon was really tired from working at the castle or there was something on his mind. Hawk was sure he didn't want to hear it. Sorry about making you clean the stables, Hawk said, tracing figure eights in the air with his stick as Falcon approached. Hmm? Oh, said Falcon distractedly. It wasn't so bad. Hawk executed a couple more satisfying swoops. You ready? 
He tossed Falcon a stick from the ground, then pointed his stick at Falcon menacingly. I shall defeat you without mercy. Falcon didn't even raise his stick. Hawk, are you listening to what people are say around here? Bad things seem to be happening in Sigborg. Hawk shrugged. Why did Falcon always have to put such a dismal spin on things? Nothing bad's happened to me, he pointed out. Now, put your feet apart more and hold your stick like this. I want to try this thing I saw the Shearmeister do in case uh, I get to practice with him. Falcon didn't move. The sheriff says that smart adventurers don't even come to Sigborg, he said quietly. Hawk sighed, resting on his stick for a moment. Apparently, there was no distracting Falcon from his prophecies of doom. Why did he always try? No wonder it's dangerous in Sigborg, he replied irritably, if all that come here are the dumb adventurers. Come on, Falcon, I need to practice. Did you hear about all the fires in town? Of course, some kobold or something, if you believe the giddy centaur girl. And did you hear about the Baron's son? Hawk stopped in surprise. The Baron had a son? Who had Falcon been talking to, and why did he know things that Hawk didn't? He'd barely been here a day. Um, I, I haven't heard the details ex exactly, Hawk said lamely. According to Wolfgang, the Baronet Barnard rode off one day and never came back. The Baron put up a reward, but no one's ever found him. A thrill shot up Hawk's spine. That's it, he said. I'll be the one to find the Baron's son. That's ridiculous, Hawk. He's been gone for two years. Everyone says he was eaten by a monster. There's nothing you can do. There's always something I can do, Hawk insisted stubbornly. If he was dead, wouldn't someone have found his body? I'll find him. I know I will. How? Falcon said, his voice spiraling upward in panic. This place is cursed. How could you possibly do what the guild master and the sheriff and the baron can't? It's not what I can do that they can't. It's that what I won't do that they have, Hawk said. What won't you do, said Falcon, his brow furling in confusion. Hawk just grinned at him. I won't give up, he said. Now, are you going to practice with me or what? Falcon sighed, but mercifully let the subject drop. Owl wasn't sure why he brought the book. It was one of the things he'd done in recent memory that just didn't seem rational. Hawk had obviously taken his sword for a good reason, and even Falcon's shield could be useful if he ran into trouble. But the book was heavy, and if you analyzed it, pretty useless. He hadn't brought it to read. He had dozens of other lighter books that he might have brought for that purpose, some of which were new enough that he'd only read them a couple of times. The book, on the other hand, had been with him since he'd come to the village at the age of three. It was a Silmarian reading primer with gold-edged pages bound in deep blue leather. Most of the pages were blank. He hardly ever opened it any more. But the fact was, the book was his. Irrational or not, Owl simply couldn't part with it, even for a few days. He was fond of flipping through the pages, looking at the illustrated alphabet with its rich, vibrant colors. The apple was so red, the boat so brown, the castle so gray, somehow never fading with the passing years. The odd, spicy smell of the smooth, silk-smooth pages comforted him. And so the book went him to Sigborg, tucked under his arm since he suspected that his satchel was too flimsy to hold its weight. His ragged cloak sheltered it from the cold air. Actually, he was pleasantly surprised by the weather. Having never slept out of doors before, he had been prepared to spend the night huddled miserably in the bitter wind. But the wind had been calm and the sky overcast. With the shelter he had found in the lee of a large boulder, the warmth of his campfire and the cover of his cloak, he'd slept reasonably well. It occurred to Al that Falcon and Hawk would be shocked to see that he'd made the journey by himself. They always acted as though he was helpless. 
What would that change when he arrived in Sigborg looking none the worse for wear? The thought of their reaction alone was almost worth the trip, although he chided himself for thinking that way. He was here for one reason, and one reason only, to find a practitioner of magic and determine whether or not he had the capability to learn spells himself. Although his sheer logic told him it was unlikely, another inner voice clamored to be heard, one that unsettled him with his urgent faith. You know you have the gift, it said. You've always known. But that just didn't make sense. He'd heard nothing to suggest that those endowed with magical ability could somehow sense it before their powers were revealed. As far as he understood it, magic talent without the knowledge of spells was as dormant and useless as perfect pitch in one who had never heard music. A movement in the trees off to his left interrupted his thoughts. He was, brief, he was startled briefly, thinking of the bears and wolves that were common to the mountains. But then good sense intervened, and he realized that first he was now in Sigberg Valley, within walking distance of farmland and civilization, and second, wild animals tended to stay away from the roads, fearful of men's bows and arrows, or so it had said in the books that he'd read. He squinted, wishing once again that he could see things from the distance better. Two men were approaching from the cover of the pines north of the road, and it took him much longer than it should have to realize he was in danger. The first man had a fierce, fearsomely shaved head and a large wooden club. The second man carried a wicked-looking dagger. His most prominent feature was a revolting scarred indentation where his nose should have been. These were not likely to be the welcoming committee. What you got in the bag, kid? said the bald man, staring at the crude leather pack Al had slung over his shoulder. The two men were already close enough for their rank smell to reach his nostrils, too close for Al to run. They'd either catch him, or worse, throw a dagger. I haven't got much, Al said honestly, but you're welcome to take a look. At the same time that his left arm tightened around his book, he used his right to slip the satchel off his shoulder and hand it to the noseless man. The man snatched it away, the dagger held in a way to show off its blade. That's a good boy, said the bald man, in a voice like rusty nails rattling in a drawer. No one wants to get hurt, do they, No Nose? No Nose just glowered as he passed the bag to his partner. It would seem he wasn't in full agreement on the matter. The bald man started to rifle through the bag, his expression turning quickly to one of irritation and disgust. What's this? Rags? Dried apples? Moldy cheese? You're a waste of time, boy. Al resisted the urge to say, I told you so. Now that they knew he was only a peasant, surely they would leave him alone. No nose glared at Al, his eyes sharp and bright. He said something, then pointed. Between his pro provincial accent and his disfigurement, the words were barely, were practically unintelligible, but when Al saw where he was pointing, he stiffened with dread. It's nothing, Al said, clutching the book even more tightly. The thought of this filthy brigand hands on his immaculate golden pages made him sick to his stomach. It would be no of use of you to you. How about you let us decide that, said the bald man with a nasty grin. Where are the pros here? No nose approached Al and made a grab for the book. Al tried to pull away. It's only a... The words cut off as he felt cold still against his throat. His arm loosened of its own accord, and the man without a nose grabbed the book, handing it over to his bald companion. The bald man opened it and flipped through it. Al saw a flash of the blank pages in the sun, the ones he assumed were meant for copying, but that he'd never had the heart to write on. Now, in the space of less than three seconds, these attackers carelessly befouled every single page. <laughs> this should be handy for getting us fire started, at least, the bald man said, kindling so damp this time of year. Al thought, felt a vein throb in his temple. 
Please give it back to me, he pleaded, desperate to see if the dirt would brush off the pages. You can have anything else you want. You don't got anything else, kid. And if you did, we still wouldn't give you back your stupid book. The man looked at his companion. He doesn't get it, does he? No Nose shook his head, then contorted his face in a grotesque parody of a smile. The bald man grinned back. Oh, how sweet. I think we're his first brigands. Al forced himself to think. He was going to lose his book no matter what he did. But if the brigands were going to burn it, they might as well put him on the fire as well. Please, he said, a sudden calm descending. I, I must have it back. It's priceless. Priceless, says the bald man. Don't you mean worthless? What good's a stupid book except for tinder? It's from Somaria, said Owl. That's genuine Somarian leather stamped with gold, and it's magical. The last he added as an, on an impulse, though he suddenly had an irrational certainty that it was true. He'd always suspected it. Wasn't that really why he brought it? A magic book, huh? said Baldy thoughtfully. Right. Does that look like gold to you, No Nose? He proffered the book to the noseless man's inspection. No Nose inspected the book, then gave a curt nod. What a waste of gold, the bald man said with disgust. To Owl's intense relief, however, the brigand seemed to be handling the book more respectfully. All right, so it's valuable. I guess we should give it back then. The bald man held out the book for a split second, then jerked it before Al could move. Oops, I forgot. We're brigands. No nose made a revolting sound that Al could only assume was a laugh. Nice dealing with you, kid, said Baldy. Come on, no nose, no point in using that dagger. The noseless man looked a bit disappointed, but he turned anyway to follow his companion back to his woods. Al felt the calm desert him at the sight of his book disappearing in the distance. Please, he shouted at the retreating backs. Give it back. I'll do anything. It's all I have. Not true, kid, said the bald man with a final glance over his shoulder. You got more, more, more than most of the folks in the graveyard. Don't push your luck. The two men disappeared into the trees, and Al stood in the road for a moment, watching them go. Then, humiliated even though there was no one to see, he collapsed in the middle of the dirt road and buried his face in his shaking hands. What should I have done? he argued with himself mentally. I'm not a fighter like Hawk. Falcon can at least protect what's valuable to him. All on good at his reading and thinking. So think then, what does a man do when he's no good at fighting, but finds something worth fighting for? Al looked up. The answer was obvious once he stopped feeling sorry for himself. He needs to find someone else to fight for him. And that is the end of chapter five.